Hello. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. It's been quite a journey. I've had quite a time. And um, I'm looking forward to this next year. I think we have a lot to accomplish together. And uh, here's my new theory after the long journey I've been on. So, Judy, where are you? Looking for you? It's, we're done. You got it? Okay, let's move on. I've got a new book coming out. It's called Captive Audience. It's coming out in November 2012. My new theory is that all of this is the fault of the baby boomers that we somehow got into position over the last 10 years in which individualism, sort of, you could call it selfishness, drove us to deregulate the entire telecommunications sector without actually thinking of how that might play out for our children and their future. So we got libertarianism, they got bored with all of these uh, social programs that existed after the Second World War, and now the stakes are extraordinarily high. You know, this has been an incremental crisis for a long time, this telecommunications world, but now it's an actual crisis because the phone system is coming to an end. So here we go. What's going on? Next, next slide. Uh, think about banking. If we're getting rid of commodity banking and a regulated banking sector, just imagine what we're doing to ourselves with telecommunications. Right now, a third of Americans don't, no longer have landlines and uh, industry... Already gotten rid of the requirement of having a carrier of last resort. This is a big deal because water, electricity, and telecommunications are traditionally functions of all of us. A collective responsibility we have to every citizen in America to make sure that, as in Winona, Minnesota, the educational, health benefits of society are given to everybody. How are we going to, what are we going to do? especially now as traditional phone service, that basic network is now coming to us in the form of internet access. That's our basic network. That's the thing the world is depending on for communications. So what's, what are we gonna do? So what's basic? That's gotta be our thought. Um, keep going. So imagine the upsides of the phone system. Economists call these things positive externalities, but we know what they are. They're new ways of making a living, lots of positive returns to scale. If the whole country has a network, that means we sell into a bigger market. That means new ideas emerge and new ways of making a living. A globally standard communication system. When we first had phones, we joined the world of phones. Really important, personal and communications and uh, commercial freedom. If you don't have to worry about what a gatekeeper is going to do to your business, the transaction costs are lower, you can reach a bigger market, and you can just keep the information flows going. All of this comes with a tremendously good trade-off for the carriers. They get limited liability. That's the deal of a basic communication system. So keep going. Now imagine giving up on that 100-year-plus-year-old system. It's like giving up on the Postal Service. It's like giving up on clean water. It's like giving up on an interstate highway system. And now that basic network is a fiber investment. So what's the social contract? Everything has a cost these days, but nothing seems to have value. A lot of the uh, media executives I talk to in connection with writing captive audience would say to you, I live in New York. I would never take the subway. That's not part of my life. I pay for things that I need. I don't want everybody to have it's not a priority for me to have, have everybody have the ability to be online at a high speed. Imagine America without this interstate highway system. We'd just be a series of villages connected by dirt paths. That's, that's our risk. Imagine us without clean water. And imagine America without a reliable commodity banking system. The social contract should be as it is in a bunch of other industrialized nations that we each have a basic communication system and that should be fiber access. All right, so about the looming cable monopoly and the wireless duopoly. Uh, these two worlds are quite separate. They're complementary businesses. Cable is now grabbing enormous market share. I have some more figures on this today for you. So on the wired side, we're seeing great advantages of scale and scope, pricing power that's really very strong. Um, for both of these businesses, both the wireless business and the cable business, average, re average revenue is up 
revenue is up and all arrows are pointing in the right direction and there's really no competition. Um, more about that in a moment. And now Verizon and, uh, and Comcast and Time Warner are collaborating. We're seeing that in the, the Spectrum Co. deal of December 2011. You take wired, all take wireless. We predicated deregulation on the idea that these companies would compete with each other. It's now very clear that they're not going to. And so meanwhile, a third of Americans don't have high-speed internet access. So crisis plus the phone crisis is really adding up. And uh, in the course of writing this book, I uh, reached out many times to David Cohen, who is the brains behind Comcast, a brilliant guy, very good political maneuverer, and very, very smart. I suddenly got a message back from his assistant, Midway, saying, David will have lunch with you on May 26th. And I wrote back immediately saying, yes, I'll be there. Turns out he was writing to the Susan Crawford who works for AT&T. <laughs> Yeah, how about that? And I, I, I've sort of restrained from telling that story because it's a little bit of a gotcha on the executive assistant who screwed up. But there were two Susan Crawfords, at least. There are many of us. And uh, Cohen actually never talked to me. And this is a way of uh, marginalizing the set of issues that we're, we're now, I hope, going to be getting much more attention in the coming year as the phone system crisis becomes more apparent. So some more numbers here. Comcast is doing extremely well. Here's, here's average revenue per user over the last... 10 years, from about $60 a month to about 140 So the bundles that we're all talking about, the penetration's going up, costs are going down. In 22 out of 25 of America's largest cities, Comcast is the provider with a little bit of competition. They let keep going so they don't have to worry about regulation. Uh, next slide. Um, what's happening is that there are very steady gains for cable as DSL becomes less and less attractive to users. That's this value proposition we heard about in the last panel. So the, the purple line on the upper right is all the market share gains uh, or percent change in Broadgram subscribers for uh, Comcast. Time Warner there is running close second. Verizon overall is gaining some customers. That's based on Fios. We'll go over the numbers in a second. But look at DSL. For both Verizon and for AT&T, it's just crumbling. They're losing subscribers hand over fist, and they're losing them to cable, this looming cable monopoly. So uh, all shares keep going, are uh, going to cable. So Comcast, here are the final numbers for this quarter. They're up to 18.5 million broadband subscribers, up 14% over the last two years. Time Warner Cable up 10%. Now, AT&T DSL is down 22% over the last two years, and Verizon DSL is down 21% over the last two years. Now, Fios overall, first quarter, has about 5 million subscribers. Compare that to the very dominant share we're seeing on the cable side, Comcast with 18.5 million and Time Warner with uh, 10. Uverse has about 6 million. We know that where Fios exists, it's a real pressure for cable, but we also know that they're not expanding and that uh, Verizon Files is present in only about 15% of Comcast territory, only about 11% of Time Warner's cape territory. Poor cable vision is struck with, stuck with actually having to compete. Uh, so they're struggling. Take a look at cable vision's numbers these days. All right, so keep going. That's what's going on. So it's very good to be Comcast. Internet revenue uh, up 10% from the prior quarter. So their gains are accelerating and their availability to extract uh, rents from consumers is also increasing with time. Um, average revenue per user up 4% from the prior quarter. At the same time, look what a great market they can dig into. Most of AT&T's DSL subscribers are getting very slow speeds and this isn't going to be adequate for Americans uh, moving forward. Okay, so next slide. Here's, okay, Goldman Sachs asks a question of Comcast on their last earnings call. Jason Armstrong, he's worried about whether uh, Comcast is actually using their pricing power, that means their ability to raise prices, as growth is exceeding. He said, look, how are you managing your volume growth? Is this, a, is this a saturated market? You could exercise more pricing power. You could be raising prices more quickly. Comcast is unconstrained by either competition or regulation. Here's the answer from Comcast. Next bullet. Click. Neil Smith says, look, we're doing fine. We increased the average revenue per user 4%. We're still driving growth. 
we feel there's still some pricing power. We can still keep raising prices and continue to grow because there is no competition. It's just up to us to decide how we're going to run this market. Okay, so it's good to be Comcast, and for wired access, the future of internet. reaping enormous returns. Next bullet. Wire line margins, that's this dying uh, DSO market that AT&T and Verizon are walking away from, are quite low. Low 30s for AT&T and low 20s for Verizon. Next slide. Verizon is doing slightly better than AT&T. Why? Because they sold off a lot of their wireline uh, assets to tier two telcos who are now going to crumble. Watch those tier two providers. Verizon will say, look, to help America, really all you need is 4G access and an iPad. That's the answer for America's uh, communications crisis. Um, we know Files is a better service, but again, it's only in limited parts of, um, of the country. Next slide. Where's all this money going? Okay, you may wonder. Uh, so free cash flow margins are very high for both Comcast and Verizon Wireless. Keep going. Comcast is spending more than 30% of that free cash flow on dividends and share buybacks. In other words, they're propping up their share price at the expense of expansion. It makes sense, this isn't evil, this is just the way a company works. In fact, Comcast is a great American success story, starting from a few systems in Mississippi to the current place they are now. Uh, Comcast is sending, spending out 11% of its revenues in dividends, next bullet. So rather than expand, they're propping up their share prices and extracting more money from consumers. Where consolidation is possible, and we've made it possible in America, competition is impossible. So the entire regulatory scheme that we put together based on competition is just not going to happen with these uh, big players. Next slide, please. Okay, so, hello slide. Okay, so high margins are being plowed back into supporting share prices. I just want to ram that point home again. That's what's going on. And second bullet, what about the 99%? This really is an issue just like banking, just like uh, clean water and electricity. What does it mean to be an American? Shouldn't we all have access? Next one, what happened to commercial and personal freedom and affordable basic services for everyone? Is it even possible to have this conversation without sounding nuts in America? Next one. Here are five big myths we're going to have to uh, go after in the next year. The first one, unleashing wireless. It almost feels like puppies are running around in the, you know, the hard corridors of the FCC because we're constantly talking about unleashing. If we could just unleash, everything would be fine. And so we have this theory that unleashing wireless is going to solve everything. It will not, the laws of physics tell us that a wireless connection is going to be 20, 40, 100 times slower than a wired connection. And we could say wireless solves something, but that means we're leaving half of America with a second best network, and that's not who we are as a country. Look at all these cool new devices and apps. We're very distracted by shiny objects. This is one of the principles of successful companies. First, erect barriers to entry and lock out competition. Second, focus on the perception of the product, not its reality. And that's what's happening with wireless devices and wireless applications. It looks as if there's a lot of competition, hand spinning, things are happening. But in fact, these are pretty slow networks. And in fact, we're not keeping up with the rest of the world. Here's the third myth. You're just a socialist, Marxist, radical, crazy person. I'm, I'm familiar with this argument. If we look at <laughs> if we look at other countries, perfectly respectable beer drinking companies like countries like Australia, uh, New Zealand, um, more relevantly probably the Netherlands, uh, Japan, Korea, we've got other developed countries who see this as a matter of industrial policy. This is just a collective thing that needs to be provided. It doesn't make them socialist. It means they say to have a free market, there's got to be this basic level of connectivity. 
Okay, what's the next myth? No one really needs a gig. Um, and uh, we're encountering this actually in our own country as well. These people just want to watch pornography. Why should we be giving them great connectivity? Uh, not true. And it, I was very moved by the statements on the last panel about I care about social value, health applications, education. If you want to make a remote video call, that could be for an educational purpose. Lots of wonderful, positive things happen in the country and we'll need that gig. The rest of the world does. Um, it's too expensive. This is just too expensive. We can't do anything. This is where this myth, which is the same thing we saw with the electricity world back in the 20s, it's just too expensive, not everybody needs it, it's luxury, is one that we really have to go after because in comparison to the things we spend our money on as a country, a basic communications network seems like a good investment and we need a cadre of economists explaining to everybody how good this is for the entire country. Um, it's just not too expensive. Uh, the, the broadband plan um, number of $350 billion to get to a fiber network for all Americans is, I believe, radically overstated, and we've got to look for um, more realistic figures. And I think the people on the last panel are telling us these businesses can be successful and costs are way overstated. Okay, so here's the consumer top 10 that I hope consumers will wake up and watch for this issue. So number one, number 10, I just got back from Amsterdam and boy, we live in a third world country. Um, number nine, I feel like no one cares about us out here in the country, in, this, in the er inner city. There are a lot of people who feel unrecognized and unserved when it comes to access. We somehow have to tap into that energy and give those people a place to go and complain. Next, uh, the service on my landline phone is awful. It doesn't feel worth it. But if I cancel, what will take its place? This is the crisis of the, the loss of phone service. This is another consumer story we've got a lot to latch on to. Number seven, I can only afford cell service. How do I apply for a job? That's a problem. How do you fill out a resume uh, using a wireless device? Number six, uh, people always say, well, just go to the library. Well, the libraries are pummeled. They're completely overcrowded. They can't serve all Americans. It's not really their function. More, I can't tell what these guys are charging me, but it keeps getting more expensive. What is going on? These impenetrable, shiny bundles of quad play services. Number four, why can't I watch sports without paying $150 a month? This big problem, I hope that we'll be able to uh, get attention with the sports, sports story. Here's a big one. Why can't I use my new 4G iPad? These beautiful devices go into people's hands. They watch a movie for an hour or a best basketball game, and then suddenly they've used up their data allowance for the month. <laughs> That doesn't make sense, and we know why it's happening, those of us who study this stuff. These are very limited capacity networks. You'd have to have a whole lot of fiber built into them in order for uh, basic, you'd have to be standing next to the tower, but in order to get more capacity, we'd have to change things. Okay, number two, what happened to basic service in America? It can't be nuts to talk about this kind of thing. And number one, why is our country so unequal? How could it be that there are uh, there's a very small group of people who are making tremendous amounts of money from what should be a basic service and others who aren't served at all. So what needs to happen? Now, it's very difficult to do anything with Congress. Uh, public outrage would be good. Support for muni networks. The, this last panel um, was tremendous in giving us down to the ground human stories of change in communities brought about by muni networks. We may be able to string together these networks in a way that helps a lot of Americans. I certainly hope so. Uh, reclassification of high-speed internet access as a basic service needs to happen, and the FCC could just do this. Um, and a change perspective that all these magical apps and devices don't happen because they're better. They happen because policy makes Makes, it makes it impossible for gatekeepers to keep the status quo in place. And actually, policy is relevant, just as it is in banking, for um, a safety net, a basic service that protects all Americans. All right, so just three steps. Let's treat access like a utility, require all those last miles to be shared, subsidize big fiber pipes where there are inadequate links to internet exchange points. That's a tough one. Support, again, support municipal networks. And we really have to pay attention to this. So uh, let's run down these bullets. This whole movement needs better graphics. Um, <laughs> thank you, Greg. You're exactly right. 
uh, needs better news coverage, better numbers, um, better consumer stories, more movies, real visuals, narratives of people's lives, a phalanx of credible economists, an election issue in each congressional district. This should be, as it is in Australia, a matter on which people are elected or not. Uh, Australia should certainly become relevant. And cheap fiber access is going to transform everything we do as a country. It's really at the basis of all of our other policy attributes that are, that are so difficult. But moving on, we got to pay attention somehow. But here's some of my favorite quotes from my journey over the last couple of years. <laughs> a cable executive told me the other day, what you're talking about would be so disruptive. <laughs> be so disruptive. I say, well, yes, yes, it would be. It would be disruptive. Uh, Ivan Seidenberg wrote back to the New York Times after I did my, my big op-ed in December, and he said, America has a very good broadband story. Someone just had to be willing to tell it. Uh, and his story is that we don't have a state-sanctioned monopoly, and so therefore things are going really well. What we, what we have is even worse. We have a set of private monopolies without any uh, regulation on them. And then here's a great quote from Brian Roberts, which I just want you all to know about. Terrific guy, great CEO. Uh, run down both bullets here, keep going. Broadband is really the area of growth for the cable industry. Uh, they're seeing enormous growth, as my numbers demonstrated earlier. And one more bullet. What he's saying is that in each market where Comcast exists, he's looking for 90 or 100% penetration for broadband. How is that possible? Because he only has one competitor, and that competitor is Verizon Fios, and they're collaborating. You take wireless, I'll take wired. This morning, the cable companies, the big ones, announced that they're going to be uh, allowing wireless roaming, uh, they're collectively doing this, um, outside of their in-home networks. And this is possible because they're really big, and so they can beat up the, the wireless carriers or cooperate with them to permit uh, roaming. But it also demonstrates that wireless is a complementary with an E service, not a substitute for uh, fiber deep into a network. So he's, what Roberts is also saying here is that I like this position. I like where I am. Netflix is dependent on me, got my grace to, to exist. And you know, Facebook Junior, the next Google, that's great for Comcast. But the next Google actually won't come from America if we don't have the sandbox to play in, the market to address, that is all Americans uh, using that system. So one final note for you. In sum, this is just, this issue is becoming just like the private firefighter in Tennessee, you guys read this story, who uh, you had to pay for fire service in a particular town, and if you failed to pay, pay they would, may might show up to avoid having your fire spread to other protected houses, but otherwise would just let the house burn down. We are at risk of letting our own country just sink even farther and farther because we see connectivity as a private service that has to be paid for by rich people. What that does is allow the rich to be gouged. They're paying more and more, more and more. The poor get left out, and so we have to subsidize them at even higher cost to the country as a whole. That's the basic economic story, and it's just like this private firefighter story. Economists talk this network isn't excludable, really. There are such big spillovers to everyone, services that are useful, markets that are useful to the whole country, that it is a public good. And uh, the market isn't going to provide this, and our free market won't function without it. So let's use the end of landline phones as the crisis, because it is a crisis, and it really is ripping at the fabric of the country. There has to be a way to make this issue into consumer radar screen important element. Right now, we've got, uh, it's, it's too technical. We're talking to ourselves. We're not speaking to everybody else in the rest of the country about what a vital issue this is. So I need your help because I plan to do everything I can to make this into a national issue and make it into an election issue for everybody. I take no money from anybody except Harvard. Thank you, Harvard. And uh, also, I'm a columnist now for Wired and Bloomberg View, and I don't want any money, so I think I can keep talking without getting attacked. And I need better number, better graphics, better economists, <laughs> a whole better story uh, to make sure that the support we're seeing for communities by these muni networks on the last panel can be extended to everybody in America. Thanks very much.
two minutes for questions? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, Benoit, Felton, a brief, keep the questions brief, please. Thank you. Susan, I've been puzzling about this, and I'd like to have your views on this since you know the political circles much better than I do. How come there is no political appropriation of these issues? Because uh, we have extraordinarily powerful, very concentrated in industries in whose interest it is that there is no political appropriation of these issues. David Cohen has said publicly, this issue is maybe on number 150 on a congressman's radar screen. There is no upside to taking this up in Congress because all you'll do is destroy uh, the campaign contributions that will come to you from these actors. So happy birthday, Senator Franken. It's his 61st birthday today. <laughs> he has been willing to take this stuff on. Ed Markey has. But otherwise, there's no appetite because there's no upside. Andrew. Hi. Uh, Andrew Feinberg from The Hill. How are you? Hi. Um, I'm curious. Um, you spent a lot of time on the inside. And there was a lot of hype, for lack of a better word, when the Obama administration came into town because we all thought, oh, these people get it. To what extent is that true? And to what extent was that just hype? And I have one follow up. Okay, um, that's a deeply personal question. Uh, I, I have been radicalized by my experience on the inside. I'm not by nature a public advocate. Um, <laughs> I'll keep going. I'll keep going. I, I, there was enormous excitement. I can't even describe to you how exciting it was to see our president elected. And to be asked to serve was the greatest honor I'll ever have. Um, and then reality kicked in. And uh, I think the stimulus program, the BTOP program and the BIP program, especially BTOP, are points of light for the Obama administration. But that took guerrilla warfare to make sure that it came off. And we've got an extraordinarily gifted staff at NTIA pulling this off, and they're doing their level best, and we should support them right and left. But there are a lot of other pressures on this entire construct. And remember, the country was sliding into an abyss. The car business, car manufacturers were going out of business. The banks were caving at the beginning of 2009. Everything was going wrong. Telecommunications, not the highest priority issue at the outset. I think we had higher hopes that this would be, as things got better for the economy, this would become a higher priority issue. I still have hopes that that will happen in the second term of an Obama administration. And I do think Mr. Obama should be reelected. I think it's much better to have him there. Um, so answer is, I have been radicalized. It was difficult. And uh, we'll see where this fits in the second term. And I have high hopes that it will fit. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Hi. Aaron. Yeah. Hi, Aaron Kaplan here um, from Vienna, from across the pond. Yeah. Um, did, did you did I see that correctly? It was hundred and fifty dollars per month, right? Hundred and forty dollars per month average revenue per user. Okay. That's up more than hundred and fifty percent since in the last ten years. Amazing. Because yeah. I I pay like twenty euros per month for right. th thirty five megabits if I want to have 100 megabits? Well, that's for video customers. And so what's going on, yeah. there's a lot of bundling of content as well. Right. So that's for the yeah, video for the customers, bundle. for the bundle. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. The second thing that I was wondering about, like, it, does that mean $150 per month in case I want to have access to like free speech on the internet? Right? Is um, that affordable for everybody? It's not affordable for everyone. Yeah. A, a, so, but that's a, a that's basic an issue. That's it's a basic a issue, right? Big issue. Yeah, yeah. right. So, you put so, your finger on it. We have right, a big so, issue. Yeah. This is the states, right? <laughs> I mean, this is. Yeah, this is the place where the internet came from. Yeah, and yeah. freedom of speech came from. So. Very good. Very okay. good. So, okay. <laughs> um, so, I would like to thank Susan very personally, <laughs> and um, you know, you're my hero and oh. keep it up. Oh, one, one thing I wanted to say is Susan's right that BIP and BTOP were guerrilla trench warfare to get them into the bills and through Congress. Um, what she didn't say was who was 
fighting in the trenches. So let's give Susan a huge round of applause for all of her good work. No, no. Thank Nobody you, does anything in government alone, ever, ever, ever. There are many skilled people. But thank you to David and also to Benoit for letting me speak uh, now. I really appreciate it. And thank you for this wonderful conference. Thank you. My pleasure.